This Sunday, we begin our summer worship series, which is all about journey, about pilgrimage, and about what that journey of transition to transformation can mean for us and for our world. And during these next six weeks, we're going to be following the story in Exodus and Deuteronomy of that 40 year pilgrimage in the wilderness in which the children of Israel were transformed. The story begins today at the very beginning of the book of Exodus. And a little bit of background, at this point in the story, Israel and the children of Israel had been living in Egypt for many generations, ever since the time of Joseph. But as Exodus begins, Joseph has died, and all of his brothers and sisters and all of those of that generation. And there arose a new king in Egypt. Let us listen for the word of God. The new king did not know Joseph. And the king said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war befall us, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, the Egyptians sent taskmasters over the Israelites to afflict them with heavy burdens, and they built for Pharaoh store cities. But the more they were oppressed, the more the children of Israel multiplied and the more they spread abroad. And the Egyptians were in dread of the people of Israel. So they made the people of Israel serve with rigor and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in all kinds of work in the field and in all of their work they served with rigor. Now in the course of many days, the king of Egypt died and the people of Israel groaned under their bondage and cried out for help and their cry under bondage came to God. And then God said, I have seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me and I have seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. And God said, I will be with you. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Amen. Will you join me in prayer? God, stir in our hearts. Open us to a wider imagination. And amidst all that is fearful and anxious in us, transform into strength and hope and renewal. And indeed, God, make of us the people that you call us to be and that you need in this place and in this time. Amen. Meriwether Lewis 
dipped his hands into the icy stream and he took a long drink. And he thought back over all of those last 15 months that had led him to this place. 15 months of long, hard travel, an endless stream of days, of nervous nights in a strange land, of mosquitoes galore, of grizzly bears, the death of a beloved companion, all that it had taken to get to this place and this time and this at last, this long good drink from the source of this river. And now here he was at the source of the Missouri River and he knew what everybody knew what had called Jefferson to invite Lewis and Clark to lead this expedition, that here at the source of the Missouri River, they would look out and see and discover what people had been looking for for so long. And that was that river route that everybody knew, everybody assumed existed that they would walk across a little bit of land and, found and find their ways to the source of the Columbia River that they would take down to the Pacific Ocean after 15 months of a long, hard journey. They were ready to find their way to the other side, to find their way home. It's a year ago today, it's July 19th, 2019. Here we are in the beginning, middle of summer. You've been at summer camp all week and you're really looking forward to summer camp next year when you get to be a CIT. You're sitting here this year all excited about the big wedding you've planned for a year ago, a year, a year from now, in July of 2020, when you're going to gather together friends and family from all over the place here to your home in Booth Bay Harbor. You are thinking, you know, it's time for a career change. And I'm really excited about stepping out and taking a risk. And I am so excited. I have just bought this new restaurant. You're thinking already a year ago today about that great graduation party that you're going to have then at the end of your senior year. You think about all the people you're going to invite and you think about how excited you will be a year from now as you're anticipating going to college and all the new friends you'll meet and going away far from home. Lewis looked up after his long cold drink in the stream and he took out full of expectation to find that pathway to the other side. And instead, at the crest of the hill, he and his party did not look out and find the source of the Columbia River. But instead, they saw what they never had imagined seeing. A tremendous, terrible line of mountains, as he wrote, that went on and on for as far as the eye could see mountains like he had never seen before. And here we are on July 19th, 2020. And whatever we thought a year ago of what 2020 had to bring, we've all had to rethink and reimagine as we are living lives that we never imagined living. 
The mountains look different for us today than those Rocky Mountains looked to Meriwether Lewis, but they are just as terrible and just as big and go on and on for as far as the eye can see. For the first time in over a century, all of us throughout the world are looking up and out at that same set of terrible mountains that go on and on, a coronavirus that we have been living with now for over six months, that has taken already today the lives of over 140,000 Americans, tens of millions of Americans out of work, more confirmed cases in this country than any other country in the industrial world. A series of mountains that go on and on, and as Mary Ann said, that we do not know when will end and how we're going to find our way through. And perhaps those mountains also look a little bit more personal and particular for you. Here you are at this juncture in your life, facing, facing a health crisis or health situation that you have never dealt with before and don't know quite how you're going to do it, or walking there with a loved one in a time of challenge and change in their lives. Perhaps it's been a death and a grief that keeps taking that you still are wrestling with coming to terms with. Perhaps it's a struggle, a need to just find hope when all that you hoped for seems to be lost. But whatever it is, personally, particularly together, all of us, all of us are united in facing a great line of mountains that we never imagined and have never seen before. Now, as Americans, we're both gifted and challenged in that we have a tradition, a long history of responding to challenge and the challenge of a great line of mountains in the belief that a healthy people and a healthy organization just needs to make up their mind to go and conquer the mountains and we will do it. And while that belief has at times led to a passage over the mountains. In our day, we see increasingly that just the commitment to go on and do something isn't enough. That it's not just about jumping out of our canoes and climbing the mountains, but it necessitates a deeper understanding of what change requires of all of us if change is really going to work. That it takes more than just our willpower to will our way through. Changes happen in all of our lives and we are all facing changes together and individually here and now. Change is situational. But to find our way through the mountains, we all need to find our way to transition. Transition is a three-phase reorientation process that people go through to help them come to terms, to empower them to come to terms with change. And unless we as a people are truly 
invited into a time of transition, into a time of transformation, we will not find our way into the promised land that is out there, is out there, but on a way that is in and through the mountains. A transition begins with an ending, with a letting go of an old reality and an old identity. For Lewis, it was the recognition that even though I was called to be on this journey and lead this journey because I'm this master canoeist and this great river explorer, those gifts aren't going to serve me very well as I need to become a mountain climber. For all of us with coming to terms with what has ended, with a dream, with a vision, with a self-understanding requires grief and loss. And I wonder for you and I wonder for me right now, again, in this time, what do we need to grieve? What do we need to say goodbye to so that we can make room for what comes next? A transition begins with an ending and a second phase of the transition begins with that most uncomfortable time in which we all spend most of our lives called the neutral zone, where people wander between two worlds, one dead, one that has ended, one that is over, and the other that is powerless yet to be reborn. We need to stay in that neutral zone, uncomfortable as it is, for as long as it takes for us to be transformed. And then that third stage and that third place is offered. And it is a place of new energy, of new outlook, of a new imagination and a new sense of ourselves. Now the classic text of how to do that journey, how to get through the mountains, how to make it through that which we do not know how to get through, do not know how to face, maybe do not want to face, is comes from the book of Exodus. And it's a book that's been studied by all masters of leaders of people through times of change and transition. It provides a blueprint of a way for people to let go of an old way of doing things so that they can find the way to the new way that is out there and before all of us. Now, the people of Israel had lived in Egypt since the time of Joseph, and they held considerable power. But now they were in bondage under this new king. And bondage can be a, a metaphor for any outlived way of doing things. Things might have worked before, but now we're in bondage. Things don't work that way anymore for us. And the world is showing it to us all the time right now. For one of the first times in a very long time, all of us are seeing the way that systems and structures and health care and care for one another, the way we did it isn't just working so well for us anymore. But we don't know what to do. We don't know our way to find the way through. And this time and this crisis of bondage shows up for all of us in times of a meaning vacuum. A time that we just feel frightened, we feel overwhelmed, we feel stuck, we feel like I don't know what to do. Think about those experiences and those times as a time of just being in bondage. Now, at first then, Moses had to break the hold of that bondage. He wanted to entice the Pharaoh to let my people go. 
But just like happens in those midnight demons that show up or three o'clock in the morning demons that show up in your dreams and keep you awake at night, the more you wrestle with them and try to fix them and solve them, the tighter the bind goes. And so as Moses tried to entice the Pharaoh to please let my people go, Pharaoh held on all the tighter. He said, look, instead of the state providing the straw you need to make your bricks, you all are going to have to go out and find the straw yourselves. Which leads to the second deepening of the crisis and a series of plagues to get the Pharaoh's attention and to break the bond of bondage. Now in Moses' day, it shows up in that um, great uh, set of stories about plagues of blood and frogs and boils and gnats and flies and hail and locusts and darkness and all sorts of terrible and horrible things. And plagues are showing up in our lives right now. Here we are six months in to this coronavirus. And people are tired, people are weary. We're all saying, gosh, we did what we were supposed to do. We physically distanced. We wore these darn masks. And you know what? We're just tired of it. We're just weary. We're just worn out. We just want to get rid of the masks. We just want to go back to the way life was. We just want to go and have fun. We just want to go to the beach. We want to hang out with our friends. And well, it's not working so well. Cases of coronavirus are spiking in over 40 states. We are breaking records every day as a country for the outbreak of new cases. And not only are more people getting sick and more people dying, but the coronavirus has also exposed a great racial divide that has always existed in our country. People are not being affected by this disease in equal and the same ways. In fact, in Maine, you're more than twice as likely to come down with the coronavirus if you are a person of color. And it's exposed all sorts of inequities in our society, dealing with housing and access to health care and the kind of jobs that we ask and expect each other to do that are putting each other at risk. And here's the thing. Here is the thing in the midst of the plagues that Moses didn't run in and try to help the Pharaoh find his way out of the plagues. Instead, he let the plagues exacerbate until Pharaoh recognized and saw that he had to let the children of Israel go. And here is a powerful point of today as we begin this journey together and what it takes to be a people of transformation, that fixing problems, perhaps like you, you love to be a fixer. I love to fix problems, but fixing problems is counterproductive where transformation is required. That for all of us at this time, we need to stop trying harder to fix something and to open ourselves to being transformed. In the midst of the plagues, Moses protected his people. He had them put a mark on their door to show that they were a people of a new identity, a people that were called on a journey of transformation. It was going to require of them doing things, being a different people in a different way. And it only came with the promise of God, I'm going to be with you. I will be with you. In the next six weeks, 
we are going to walk along this journey with Moses and the children of Israel, who found that the way through the problem wasn't to stay there in Egypt and try just to fix things and make things better, but would require them out onto a journey that would transform them and change them forever. As Mary Ann reminded us, on the road of the Camino, it is a road that others have walked long before. A road that is worn down six feet below. And we as a people facing those mountains go with this great hope that there are those who have walked this path of transition and transformation before us. And we are not the first, but we will be a story and a legacy for our children and for all who come after us about how we walk through this time. The good news already at this place is this, Moses, looked out at the crest of the hill, and he saw the promised land. Lewis and Clark learned how to put down their canoes and learned how to hike, and they made their way to the Pacific. John Lewis, civil rights hero who died this week, was the last living person to stand there with Martin Luther King Jr. on the March on Washington in 1963, who heard King speak of a dream that we are still, as a people, seeking to live into and embody. The good news is this. There is a dream out there and a promise out there worth finding. We can't get there alone. We have to get there together. We are called to be those people, to take that journey together. Next week, as we come and cross the Red Sea and set out into the wilderness, we step out and put our feet out for a somewhere, and a somewhere that is worth getting to. Let us, together, find our way to that somewhere and to be the transformed people of God that we are needed to be. Amen.